Now, sphagnum moss <clears throat> grows in very swampy areas. It's got a, a relatively confined habitat. But what's unusual about it is that sphagnum grows in layers. Sphagnum, as part of its growth pattern, deposits acid in the environment. This acid tends to slow down the action of bacteria, so the decomposition uh, comes almost to a complete halt. As this sphagnum grows layer on top of layer, not only is this, the lower levels acidic, but also oxygen is cut off. That is, they tend to become anaerobic. Well, the combination of anaerobiosis and acidity pretty much guarantees that those lower layers do not decompose. Eventually, they form what are known as peat bogs. Now, some of these peat layers and bogs, and by the way, they're found in vast areas of the world, in the British Isles, in Canada, in parts of Asia. Some of these bogs can be meters deep. Now, bogs can be actually used uh, as a source of fuel. They dig up the peat, dry it, and burn it. And of course, it's a cheap source. Unfortunately, the acid that these plants produce is sulfuric acid, so that the uh, byproduct of burning this peat is sulfur dioxide, which, of course, is one of the problems we have with acid precipitation worldwide. Peat can also be used commercially for shipping plants, or it can be used as a dressing uh, around nurseries, uh, around beds that you have on your property, flower beds, etc. It's a great soil conditioner for sandy soil because peat retains about three times, because it's very spongy, only partially decomposed, uh, contains about three times the amount of water of average soil. And today we're filming at a classic habitat. We're standing in the middle of a huge quaking bog on North Lake in the Catskills in New York State. The, the North Lake that surrounds the bog that we're filming in is a dystrophic lake. It has been left undisturbed by man, showing its dystrophic characteristics, the stained water. And this bog that we're standing on, and it is a quaking bog, that is, there's water around my feet. If you move on this bog, it quivers or quakes as you take steps. These are encroaching more and more into the lake. And eventually, if this dystrophic lake is left undisturbed for hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of years, the whole area will develop into bog habitat. This bog is created originally by sphagnum moss, a shallow water area in the lake where sphagnum starts to take hold. It proliferates, and it's one of the types of vegetation that basically creates its own habitat. That is to say, through ion exchange, it creates an acidity that makes it intolerable for most other plants to live in. And so the sphagnum develops and the sphagnum builds on top of previous generations of sphagnum, layer after layer, until eventually the base of this bog is formed. Now this acidity also cuts off the oxygen. That is, oxygen through this matted partially decomposed material blocks the oxygen so that you have a very acid anaerobic habitat. Now eventually as this sphagnum builds, other types of plants can move in, but they have to be specifically suited for this habitat. For example, along with the sphagnum in some types of bogs, you'll get a few ferns that may develop. One of the characteristic ferns is the Virginia chain fern. Heath plants will also start to develop. Heath shrubs such as leatherleaf or bog rosemary will start to develop, all relatively short uh, in terms of their vertical height and growth. You may also get bog cranberries developing as well. You've heard of cranberry bogs. Well, that's where they exist. That's where they do well. They love the acidity. You may also get an unusual group of types of herbs that are carnivorous. These are herbs, carnivorous herbs, that actually feed on insects. They devour the insects, digest them, and those nutrients are then passed into the bog ecosystem. Two types, the pitcher plant and the sundew. 
And of course you can get trees developing ultimately, but normally for the bog to develop trees, it has to be in an advanced stage, and these trees are always relatively few in number and are diminutive in size. Trees that are very dominant here are trees such as black spruce, certain types of pine, and occasionally balsam. Now this habitat, as we described it, is anaerobic, and it's very acid. When you're walking on it, you can actually smell the sulfur associated with the sulfuric acid. That's the kind of acid that's formed by the sphagnum. What they do is they remove calcium from calcium sulfate or gypsum for their own nutrition and they substitute the hydrogen ion forming sulfuric acid. Oddly enough, all of the nutrients that are in this bog don't come from the water below. That's basically sealed off but come from the rain from the atmosphere. Now these are the mosses. The lesser known members of this group are the liverworts. They rely on much more water uh, than mosses do. So to find these in the forest, we're going to have to look a lot closer in the environment. One of the basic axioms of ecology is that no niche in the environment ever goes unfilled. Today we're in Cathedral Gorge, and as you look at this outcropping of rocks behind me, you can see that there's all kinds of varieties of plants clinging to this moist outcropping. Uh, grasses and mosses, uh, ferns, different types of shrubs, flowering plants, and a very unusual type of plant that, again, very few people see. These are the lesser known members of the bryophytes. They're plants called liverworts, and you can see them growing on this rock below the falls. They're very, very unusual in their growth pattern. Uh, one of the crew mentioned the fact that they look like frog or amphibian skin, and they have a thallus that's sort of leaf-like or lobe-like in their growth pattern. As I mentioned, they're sort of the poor cousins of the mosses. Whereas the mosses are very widely distributed, and everybody knows what moss plants are, few people know about liverworts because they're very, very restricted in their habitat. Generally, you'll only find liverworts growing along mountain streams and forest areas or in uh, very wet habitats like this dripping uh, rock ledge behind us or under waterfalls. Their life cycle, though, is very similar to what we discussed with the mosses. If you remember when we talked about the mosses, we said that the plants themselves, and that is what we see growing here, this lobe-like pattern of growth, the plant itself is the gametophyte stage. Now, the gametophyte stage, of course, produces the gametes, the egg, and the sperm. And like the mosses, there are separate sexed gametophytes. There are male uh, plants that form antheridia and produce sperm. And there are female plants, you can't tell them apart just by looking at them, though, that form archegonia, which in turn produces the egg. And very much like we discussed with mosses, the sperm still must swim from the male plants to the female plants uh, to get to the egg and to fertilize it to form a zygote. Now, the zygote develops into the embryo in the female plant, and from that embryo develops the alternate stage, which is the sporified stage, Although these sporophytes are quite different than what we saw in the mosses. In the mosses, as if you recall, they were brushy stalks that stuck up from the plant. Here, the sporophytes are very close to the plant, and they're not very obvious. The major difference in their life cycle is that the liverworts have an additional spore stage called jemmy. It gets the name because if you see them under the microscope, they look like little gems. These spores form in cups directly on the thallus. They have nothing to do with sexual reproduction. When those spores are mature, they're sprung out of the cups by raindrops or uh, water dripping behind us, or by mammals and birds that hit the cup and knock the spores out. Then they fall to the ground and develop directly back into new liverwort plants. In our last segment in this particular lecture, we want to talk about the transitional nature of bryophytes, that is, transitional between 
the terrestrial higher plants and the primarily aquatic lower plants. And for our discussion of this transitional nature of bryophytes, we're going to go to a small mountain stream. Before we conclude our discussion of the bryophytes, I do want to take a few moments to talk about their role as a transitional species in plant evolution. Now, I mentioned that briefly before. And what I'm talking about is a transition from the lower groups of plants that we've discussed, primarily the algae, that are aquatic in nature, and the higher groups of plants that we're going to talk about later on in the semester, uh, the trees, uh, the gymnosperms, angiosperms, the flowering plants, uh, ferns, other plants like that that are dominantly land plants. The mosses and liverworts are unique in that, it is sent, in a sense, they're trapped within these two environments or between these two environments. They're very similar to the lower plants in that they still have flagellate sperm, as I mentioned previously, so they rely very heavily on water. You can see the mosses growing around me that are partly in water and partly out of water. Uh, the algae that were totally aquatic had the water to supply them with the nutrition and support, the density of water, so that they didn't need vascular tissue. Well, the bryophytes don't have it either, and that's really what's restricted them as they've made their transformation to land. Without the xylem and phloem to provide for internal circulation of nutrients, and the xylem specifically to provide for support, as land plants, they're still very, very tiny plants very restricted and still very, very strongly tied to water, as I've mentioned previously. Now, this transitional nature for the bryophytes is very similar to something we see uh, in the animal kingdom, especially among the vertebrates. And that's the group of vertebrates known as the amphibians. Now, the amphibians are transitional, too, between the earlier aquatic vertebrates, the cartilaginous fishes, the sharks, and the bony fish, bass, trout, perch, that group, and with the dominantly terrestrial higher vertebrates, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals. Amphibians also are sort of trapped, in a sense, in both worlds, in that the amphibians must rely on water for reproduction they have to come back to water, fresh water, to lay their eggs. Uh, even marine amphibians, such as the Pacific toad, has to cross land to fresh water to lay its eggs. It can't lay its eggs in the ocean. However, the adult stage has adapted to a land environment. Uh, it's evolved, uh, develops as an adult uh, legs or appendages. It's developed lungs so that it can live on land. But even on land, with its very moist skin and other limitations, it's still very closely tied to water. The liverworts, the mosses, that is the bryophytes collectively among the plants, and the amphibians among the vertebrates, these are two groups that show the very strong transition and evolution from water to land. We've referred to some of the taxonomic groups, kingdoms, for example, previously, but I did want to take a little bit of time to talk about taxonomy. Since we just discussed the bryophytes, I can use an example of a group of bryophytes that were formally classified with the liverworts, but because of DNA differences have now been placed within a group called the hornworts. Now, the hornworts are such a small group, I'm not going to spend much time talking about them, but it's an example in taxonomy how organisms are moved from one class to another. Uh, taxonomy is very fluid. There are a lot of changes that occur, and it can be a nightmare for biology students or biology professors, for that matter. We've always discussed the Five Kingdom system, and as you can see, Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae, Animalia, groups that we've talked about at the very beginning of this course, these 
organisms will move from time to time into different areas. For example, when we discuss the fungi, we discuss the slime molds as fungi. While now there is a move afoot to include them in the protease, not with the fungi, but that's not etched in stone. Uh, some uh, taxonomists still consider them as part of fungi. Another major move that's occurred recently is to split out the archaebacteria from the eubacteria as a separate kingdom. Again, we're not going to emphasize taxonomy in this, in this course. We'll mention different names, but we won't get into classes, uh, phyla, genera to any great extent. So you don't have to concern yourself with that. But I wanted to alert you as you do readings uh, in this course that you may see some classified in different areas. Uh, that's just the way it goes with taxonomy.